Heaven's Gate. It was a beautiful Wednesday afternoon in Southern California. The year was 1997. Encinitas Sheriff's Deputy Robert Brunk, 35, had reported to his afternoon shift at the San Diego County Sheriff's Department expecting to field vehicle break-ins, assist lifeguard calls, and disband drunken scuffles, the usual duties for a patrol cop in a beach town. But that day, he was told to call the dispatch center. A woman on the other end of the line said they had received an anonymous 911 call about two hours earlier reporting that a religious group had committed mass suicide. Brunk was being sent up to Rancho Santa Fe, about 25 miles north of downtown San Diego and one of the highest income areas of the United States, to check it out. Brunk and the operator had a laugh about the call before he left. Probably just a prank, he told himself on the 10-minute ride to 18241 Kalina Norte, a two-story gilded Mediterranean-style mansion in a gated community. Along the way, he rehearsed the words he'd used to explain to the home's residents who swung open the mansion's heavy double doors that he was there to investigate a tip that dozens of cultifornians had reportedly off themselves inside. Brunk pulled his cruiser up in front of the house. The mansion's gate was locked, the first sign that something was up, so he hopped it. Walking up the driveway, the officer with three years of patrol experience under his belt felt unease rise up from the bottom of his gut. He could see that the curtains were drawn and the lights were on inside the 9,200-square-foot mansion. Air conditioners were running. Multiple vehicles in the garage and driveway came back as unregistered to the mansion's owner. Brunk knocked at the front door, nothing. Around the side, he found an unlocked door. He knocked, again no answer, and opened the door. Sheriff's office, he announced, and he was met with the unmistakable smell of death inside the home. Brunk's training kicked in, he knew better than to go into a house that reeked of dead bodies without backup. About ten minutes later, Sheriff's Deputy Laura Gasek was on the scene. With their guns drawn and dispatchers aware of their movements, they entered the home. They saw the bodies around the same time, lying on bunk beds, a mattress on the floor, and a collapsible table. Not knowing what could have killed these people and suspecting that poisonous fumes could be in the air, Brunk and Gasek fled the house. Tell Omega I lost count at ten, Brunk radioed back to dispatch once safely outside the mansion, referring to the police radio code for the coroner. But there were many more than ten bodies, nearly four times that, in fact. Over the course of that late afternoon on March 26, 1997, investigators would find 39 bodies in various stages of decomposition. Cropped haircuts led investigators to initially believe that all 39 were men, but autopsies later revealed that 21 women and 18 men had died there. As if this discovery wasn't shocking enough, eight of the men had been castrated. There was another peculiarity about the scene, everyone was wearing the same loose, black clothing. A triangle patch sewed onto the left shoulder that depicted the Orion constellation read Heaven's Gateway Team. Everything was uniform, the squeaky clean, brand new Nike sneakers, the five dollar bill and three quarters in their pockets, the packed duffel bag next to the bed. They wore gold bands on their left ring finger and tucked passports or birth certificates in their shirt pockets. Eyeglasses were properly folded and placed next to their hands, in reach just in case they ever woke up again. Thirty-seven of the bodies were covered with a purple shroud, all except those who would later be determined to be the last two cult members to take their own lives with a deadly mix of applesauce or pudding cut with phenobarbital, an anti-seizure medication, washed down with vodka and aided in asphyxiation by a plastic bag. The cult's leader, Marshall Applewhite, who was known as, Dew, to his followers, was found dead in the master bedroom. Computer screens in the house displayed HeavensGate.com, the group's website, with red alert flashing in capital letters and bold red text at the top of the screen. That afternoon, the bodies were removed from the home on stretchers, 
their purple shrouds swapped out for white body bags and stacked into an awaiting refrigerated coroner's truck. Meanwhile, investigators were learning more about this group that called themselves Heaven's Gate, and why they decided to take their own lives. The cultists had spent twenty-two years studying with Applewhite and training to enter the kingdom of heaven with him. To reach this extraterrestrial realm, they would have to shed their earthly bodies. After decades of strict communal living and preparation, they found the omen that they were looking for, the Hale-Bopp Comet, discovered two years earlier in the skies above the southwest, now visible to the naked eye. Heaven's Gate believed that a spaceship tailed this comet, and that the suicides would transport the members to that awaiting spacecraft. Once on board, they'd be reunited with Bonnie Lou Nettles, or T, who co-founded Heaven's Gate with Applewhite in the early 1970s and had died from cancer more than a decade earlier. Videotapes mailed to CNN and 60 Minutes confirmed this seemingly unbelievable notion, that these 39 people voluntarily killed themselves to ascend to an evolutionary level above human. Within hours, hundreds of reporters were on the scene outside 18241 Kalina Norte, waiting for more updates on the largest mass suicide to ever happen on American soil. The people who decided to follow Du and T around the country were young, old, and in between, ranging in age from 26 to 72, living a nomadic and monastic lifestyle and learning the teachings, which had roots in evangelical Christianity, science fiction, and the New Age movement of alternative religions that were very much an extension of 1960s counterculture. They came from Florida, Missouri, New Hampshire, Canada. Before the cult, they had been graphic designers and computer developers, CEOs turned environmentalists, bus drivers, musicians, parents. One woman had joined just months before their mass suicide in March 1997, while others had been with the group for decades. Above all they were spiritual seekers who were contemplating the meaning of why we're on this planet, and beyond. There is no place for us here. It is time for us to go home, to God's kingdom, to the next level. There is no place for us to go but up. Glnodi, a Heaven's Gate student. The two. Before there was Heaven's Gate, before the thirty-nine suicides, before there was dew and tea, there was Marshall Herf Applewhite and Bonnie Lou Nettles. Applewhite, known as Herf before he became Dew, was born in 1931 in Spur, Texas. He was the son of a Presbyterian minister who uprooted the family every few years to establish new churches around South Texas. Applewhite had three siblings, a passion for music, and the ambition to follow in his father's footsteps. While studying philosophy at Austin College, Applewhite pursued both of these callings, leading extracurricular groups for aspiring Presbyterian ministers, and singing in an a cappella group. In Heaven's Gate, America's UFO religion, one classmate recalled Heaven's Gate future leader as an extrovert who was bound to use his talents for good in the world. After graduation, Applewhite studied at Virginia's Union Theological Seminary for a semester before dropping out to pursue music, taking a choir director job in Gastonia, North Carolina. An army stint relocated Applewhite and his then wife, and Pierce, to Salzburg, Austria, in 1954, followed by White Sands, New Mexico, where Applewhite served in the Army Signal Corps as an instructor and later owned the Sunshine Company Delhi in Taos. He had two children whom he was deeply devoted to, according to his sister. And with his young family in tow, Applewhite crisscrossed the United States for music-related positions. He eventually earned his master's degree in music and voice from the University of Colorado, where he landed the lead in the musical productions of South Pacific and Oklahoma. And made his way back to Texas, where he worked in churches and synagogues and taught in the fine arts program at the University of St. Thomas in Houston. Applewhite and his wife separated in the mid-1960s and were divorced by the end of the decade. He reportedly never saw his wife or his children again. Following the suicides in Rancho Santa Fe, 
much media attention was devoted to Applewhite sexuality and the cult's rigid views that required members to give up sex and leave behind their partners and children. In an April 1997 profile on Heaven's Gate in the New York Times, writer Barry Barrick described Applewhite as a sexual chameleon seen in some social circles as a dashing man about town who was always accompanied by a well-off, well-dressed woman. In other settings, Applewhite was a gay man who lived with his longtime lover in Houston's LGBT-friendly Montrose neighborhood. In a documentary interview, Heaven's Gate, Inside Story, conducted shortly after the suicides, musician and former member Michael Conyers said that Dew's Christian upbringing, coupled with the attitude at the time that homosexuality was a mental illness, fueled his belief that the body was abhorrent. He didn't like his homosexuality, he was hiding from a piece of himself that he disliked. So he created a myth around that piece that he didn't like, Conyers said. By some accounts, it was an affair with a male student that led Applewhite to resign from his teaching position at the University of St. Thomas in 1970, citing emotional health issues, and into the platonically comfortable arms of Bonnie Lou Nettles. Depending on whom you ask, or whom you believe, Applewhite met Nettles in the psychiatric ward of a Houston hospital in March 1972. Perhaps he was just at the hospital visiting a sick friend. Or maybe he was being hospitalized after a heart blockage that nearly killed him. Perhaps they didn't meet at the hospital at all, but an acting school. Whether he was committed or not, Applewhite was mentally unraveling leading up to the time of his supposed hospitalization, and took an interest in UFOs, science fiction, astrology, and mysticism prior to meeting Nettles. But his Heaven's Gate co-founder, who would later take on the name T., was way ahead of the spiritual game. Raised as a Baptist, Nettles developed an interest in the occult and started holding weekly seances in her living room for a group of like-minded seekers. They made contact with a 19th-century monk known as Brother Francis, as well as more glamorous encounters, such as Marilyn Monroe. Nettles' new age enthusiasm eventually led to a divorce from her husband, who didn't share her excitement in encountering the undead. After they were introduced, Applewhite and Nettles were immediately inseparable, and Nettles provided a nurturing spiritual base for Applewhite, who often had a hard time putting his religious experiences into words. After swiftly opening and closing both a bookstore and retreat center in the Houston area, Applewhite and Nettles hit the open road on New Year's Day, driving thousands of miles a month across the United States, up to Canada and back, subsisting at times on only bread and butter and gobbling up spiritual books from different traditions. That summer, their spiritual destiny became clear to them while camping on the banks of Oregon's Rogue River. They were the two witnesses from the New Testament book of Revelations destined to be martyred by the Antichrist. They knew the way to enter the kingdom of heaven, the level above human. All they needed was some followers to show the way. Assembling the class. God has sent us here as an experiment, so you might call us guinea and pig. Marshall Applewhite at a Los Angeles meeting. With a clear vision, Du and T were ready to start growing their flock, whom they would later refer to as, the class. They found their first convert in Sharon Morgan, a seeker who was unhappy with her marriage, and who, within six days of meeting Applewhite and Nettles, left her husband and two-year-old daughter behind in Texas to spread the word. Applewhite and Nettles spent the summer of 1974 road-tripping and proselytizing with their new convert. The trio would skip out on food and hotel bills and using the Morgan family credit card for the purchases they did pay. Morgan was forced back to conventional life about four months later, when a stop in Dallas turned into a family intervention. But her connection to Heaven's Gate didn't end there. In a New York Times story following the mass suicide, Morgan, by then a 53-year-old stockbroker who went by the last name Walsh, told the paper that her half-sister, Judith and Roland, died with the cult, and that her mother, stepfather, and niece were members as well. Police didn't move forward with any charges stemmed to John Morgan's complaint, 
but a warrant check linked Applewhite to a stolen rental car out of Missouri, fittingly, a Mercury Comet, that he was still tooling around in. Applewhite spent the next six months in jail where he further refined the Heaven's Gate mission to include the idea that he and Nettles were extraterrestrials housed in human bodies, just waiting for their opportunity to ascend to the next level. Heaven's Gate theology would change over the next two decades, particularly after Nettles' death, but this ET connection would remain a core tenet of the group. Though they couldn't keep Sharon Morgan around, Two major recruiting events in the mid-1970s would significantly increase the number of Do and T followers. Their first brush with Guru Stardom took place in 1975 in the Studio City home of Joan Culpepper, a meditation teacher, spiritual counselor, and recently laid-off advertising executive with a personal motto, Weird Turns Me On. Her friend, Clarence Klug, had recently met Applewhite and Nettles in Ojai, and helped arrange a gathering of about 80 people at Culpepper's apartment to hear about UFO teachings from the The Two and their human individual metamorphosis group, as Heaven's Gate was known back then. The two showed up in sweat suits and desert boots, according to Culpepper's account in the LA Times nearly two decades later. They were very stern, Culpepper recalled. There was not any kind of loving kindness or nurturing. They said they would die be assassinated, and anyone who followed would travel with them on a spaceship to a higher level, to heaven. A New York Times profile expanded on the two's rigidity, recreating Applewhite's rhetoric from that LA gathering, if you follow, then you must obey everything we say. That includes giving up your possessions, your family, and your entire identity. This was not a typical, sugar-coated cult recruitment. Culpepper wasn't convinced by Applewhite, she reportedly addressed him as Mr. Pig that evening and asked him questions laced with sarcasm. But anywhere from two dozen to a third of the eighty attendees were smitten, and left that night to follow Applewhite and Nettles north to the Oregon coast, in search of more recruits. Culpepper felt responsible for setting the whole thing up and spent the years to come speaking out against the cult, attending Heaven's Gate appearances to stare down Applewhite, and housing former members at a halfway house in Topanga Canyon. Later that fall, Applewhite and Nettles would make the national news after a large gathering in Waldport, Oregon, led to dozens of people walking out on their lives to join the group. According to Oregon Live, posters announcing their appearance read, UFOs. Why they are here. Who they have come for when they will leave. Their appearance drew a crowd that ranged from 100 to more than 250, according to conflicting newspaper reports, and an estimated 20 to 33 people joining up. The disappearances did not go unnoticed. Walter Cronkite, the legendary CBS News anchor and reporter, announced during a nightly broadcast that a score of persons from a small Oregon town have disappeared. It's a mystery whether they've been taken on a so-called trip to eternity, or simply been taken. Although Heaven's Gate was more popular than ever in the late 70s, ballooning to some 200 members during those years, the leaders felt mocked and shot down by the media, according to a 1988 cult document made public by the Washington Post, and this heat sent the cultists underground. No one could find Applewhite and Nettles. The group physically dispersed as well, communicating through post office boxes and covert phone messages. Some members started smoking pot openly and questioned if Applewhite and Nettles were who they said they were, according to accounts by the infiltrator sociologist Robert Balch. In April 1976, Nettles announced that, the harvest is closed, no more recruits allowed. A few months later, about a hundred followers gathered at Medicine Bow National Forest in Wyoming, where the two outlined their plan to create the human individual metamorphosis community, which included strict bans on sex and drug use. In Heaven's Gate, Postmodernity in Pop Culture in a Suicide Group, religious scholar George Chrisides describes the tough love crackdown from the two. T and Do announced that it had been rumored that some were still occasionally indulging in pot and sex. 
Everyone was asked to go off by themselves for a few hours and make up their mind as to whether they were just caught up in the fun of a movement, or if they were serious. For now the real classroom was to begin, and it was not for those who felt they wanted to hold on to human ways. T and Du preached long and hard about what it meant to rid oneself of self, and what would be required of those who continued. Membership dropped to 80 in the coming days, then to 70 when the winter storm started rolling through in October. The butter had been clarified, Nettles put it, the pure had been separated from the impure. The two had their class. In retrospect, UFOs seem far out, but not so in the 1970s New Age movement, which took an interest in flying saucers in addition to reincarnation and cosmic consciousness. The UFO phenomenon emerged in the 1940s, coinciding with the rise of Cold War tensions, and the CIA actively investigated unidentified flying objects for the next two decades. The results of a 1973 Gallup poll found that 95% Americans were familiar with the concept of UFOs, and 57% of those polled believed that UFOs were real, Presidents Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan were also believers. Conyers, who joined the cult in 1975, said he was initially attracted to the group because Applewhite and Nettles brought a scientifically relevant update to his Christian upbringing. Mary was impregnated by being taken up on a spacecraft. Now as unbelievable as that sounds, that was an answer that was better than the plain virgin birth, Conyers said in Heaven's Gate, Inside Story. Cult expert Janja Lalik had written that the appeal of Heaven's Gate was that Applewhite and Nettles were offering something different, something unique, yet familiar, by taking New Age concepts to the next level. This was not the same old trip with the best hit of acid or some old long-haired group sprouting the same old verses out of the same old Bible or Hindu text. What these two were offering seemed to be better, combining a little bit of everything and it came across as really far out, Lalik wrote in a 2004 article for Cultic Studies Review. These two prophets and their newly gathered disciples sounded knowledgeable enough and mysterious enough to entice the curious and the sincere. Life in Heaven's Gate With the freeloaders and stoners weeded out, Applewhite and Nettles started acting more like cult leaders, controlling the social and religious lives of their class. From the late 1970s through the mass suicide, the cult lived mostly underground, re-emerging only a handful of times over the next twenty years for public appearances. They were nomadic, moving around frequently and living in rented houses or campgrounds that were paid for, in part, from a member's trust fund. One of their endeavors included a half-built earth ship on forty acres near New Mexico's Manzano Mountains that they later abandoned. At times, they also lived in public parks and begged for food. In their book Cults in Our Midst, Margaret Singer and Janja Lalik write that, if you really want to change people, change their appearance, cult members can be asked or told to cut their hair or wear it in a particular style, wear different clothes, take on new names, and assume certain gestures of mannerisms. Singer and Lalik weren't specifically talking about Heaven's Gate, though the cult employed most, if not all, of these tactics. Heaven's Gate wore formless clothing, Du and T reportedly favored TJ Maxx and Burlington Coat Factory for the cult's clothes, which were all shared communally, down to the underwear. Heaven's Gate was aspiring to reach a higher level that they believed was genderless. All members had the same short haircut, and women shunned makeup, dresses, and any other attributes that might show off their feminine, human form in hopes of quashing any sexual desire or prowess. Lalik later noted in Cultic Studies Review that, at the extreme, a feeling of self-hate was instilled in Heaven's Gate members, reframed as a hatred of their human self, known as the vehicle, in their parlance. This likely stemmed from Applewhite's attitudes toward his own sexuality, and evidently struggling with one's vehicle was a requirement, and a daily reality. Life on Earth was a torturous, training ground for the next level, and any human act was seen as a detriment to them ascending to the level above human. 
One former member recalled that even though no one was having sex, that's all anyone ever seemed to talk about. In an effort to curb desire, each Heaven's Gate member was assigned a check partner to keep each other accountable in terms of sexuality in any other activity, according to Heaven's Gate rules, taking any action without one's check partner was a lesser offense. Members were advised to report any sexual fantasies or slippages to do. A slippage meant that there was more work to do to advance to the next level of consciousness. To cut future cravings off at the pass, some male members of Heaven's Gate started thinking about going directly to the source of the issue, their testicles. Applewhite students asked for years about the possibility of castrating themselves to relieve their sexual urges. In 1993, Stephen McCarter became the first to undergo the procedure after winning a coin toss against another cult member called Sawyer who was also hoping to undergo the procedure. The group wasn't able to find a doctor willing to perform the castration stateside, so McCarter had to travel to Mexico for the simple operation, which nonetheless was botched by the surgeon's assistant, and subsequently led his scrotum to heavily swell due to improper drainage. Still, seven more Heaven's Gate members, including Applewhite, went under the knife. While castration was voluntary, all other aspects of life in Heaven's Gate were by the book, literally, the procedure's book. The cult had rigid rules for just about everything. Only certain cultists were allowed outside of their rented homes in an effort to not draw attention to the group and make it appear as if fewer people were living there. Class members were assigned seating in front of the 72-inch television. The procedure's book even outlined the correct way for men to shave their face, down, not up, the appropriate shower length, six minutes, and the amount of water to be used, one gallon. Even the size of their pancakes and the amount of coffee brewed for their frequent enemas, one of the many dietary tactics used for physical and spiritual purging, were regulated. All purchases were noted in a financial ledger that kept a tally of rent payments, grocery lists, library fines, even an event during which two members found six cents. All this structure was in preparation for the discipline that they'd need as crew members on a spaceship. Heaven's Gate even had their own language to help them reach the next level of consciousness. Breakfast was known as the first experiment, Rio D'Angelo a former Heaven's Gate member, writes in his 2007 self-published book, Beyond Human Mind. The first experiment was followed, naturally, by a second and third throughout the day. Recipes were called formulas, their office was a compulup. Perhaps most puzzling is a bra, known to the cultists as a slingshot. Like many cults, Heaven's Gate created an environment where members had to walk away from their family, possessions, and identities, and could not freely come and go as they pleased. Members were given new names that included a variation of ODY at the end. Any contact with parents or other family members were initiated by Heaven's Gate members, not the other way around. As the group matured, many members went from working entry-level jobs to jobs in their areas of expertise, always secured using fake resumes and references, including web design. According to reporter Barry Barrick, the cult was bringing in around $400,000 a year after taxes. According to Michael Conyers, cult members stayed because of idle threats and fear of not being included when it came time to ascend to the next level. What ended up happening was there were these idle threats, from my point of view, of fear, that if you missed the boat, you may not get another chance. In an interview for Cults That Kill, Lalik said her theory of bounded choice explains why the Heaven's Gate cultists stayed. The idea, Lalik says, is that as you get more involved with the cult and start abiding by their rules and start to internalize their beliefs, you hold yourself accountable to stay loyal to the group or leader and follow the expected guidelines and orders. At this point, the group becomes your life you don't have any outside ideas or influences. When, you enter into this state of mind that I call, bounded choice, which means that any decision that you have to make, 
you know exactly what your choice is in order to remain in good favor of the group. And the thought of leaving the group equals death, either real or metaphorical, Lalik said. So you're totally, in a sense, paralyzed by fear of taking any other action, and you make the decision that the cult wants you to make that you yourself want to make. This whole issue revolves around free will and whether or not people have free will, and people in that video were saying I'm doing this of my own free will. So what this is is an illusion of choice, that your free will has actually been altered by the will of the group. So yes, nobody's holding a gun to your head, but they may as well be, because you know the choice that you have to make. The final exit. We're so excited we don't know what we're going to do. Marshall Applewhite. Throughout history, a comet appearing in the sky above Earth has been a cause for concern. Comets were bad omens in the Middle Ages, and have been blamed for fires, wars, the fall of the Alamo, William the Conqueror's invasion of England, even the life and death of Mark Twain, who was born two weeks after Halley's Comet was visible in 1835 and died one day after the comet passed by again in 1910. In 1908, poisonous gas had been detected on the tail of Comet Morehouse, so when Halley rolled back through, women plugged up the windows and doors of their home in hopes of keeping out toxic fumes. A Haitian voodoo doctor and two hawkers in Texas reportedly sold Comet pills, a combination of sugar and quinine, to ward off any side effects of the comet's supposedly noxious tail. But when the hale -Bopp Comet, estimated to be three to four times bigger than Halley's Comet and a thousand times brighter, appeared to two astronomers, Alan Hale and Thomas Bopp, in the summer of 1995, Heaven's Gate turned toward the discovery with excitement, not fear. They bought a telescope and took turns watching the body of frozen gases, rock, and dust. A decade earlier, Heaven's Gate co-founder Bonnie Lou Nettles had died from cancer in a Dallas hospital, where she had been admitted under the pseudonym Shelley West. Her ashes were spread in a Texas lake, and the core of Heaven's Gate theology was rocked. Though Heaven's Gate was opposed to suicide in theory, a web page on their website is devoted to this topic, Applewhite distanced himself from the idea that you could ascend to the next level while still in your earthly body. Now, he taught the class, you had to leave your vehicle to reach the next level of consciousness. In Hale-Bopp they had a sign from T that the time had come to shed their husks and join her in the next level. With the comet visible to the naked eye, Heaven's Gate made their final preparations. They started filming exit statements, taped video messages that outlined their reasons for leaving this world and convincing the rest of us that this was their choice. The videos, available on YouTube, show members of the class against a sunny, Southern California backdrop, complete with birds chirping. Some are stern, others are smiling, laughing nervously when the videographer announces that the camera is now rolling. One cultist named Lvadi said she was one of those who disappeared from Waldport, Oregon. Wearing a shapeless, plaid shirt, she quickly chokes up when describing the pride she felt as a student of Applewhite and Nettles and her happiness about their planned exit. Doubt was never an issue, Lvadi said. There's always a deep down knowing, that from the moment of seeing T and Do, that this is why I'm here, to take this vehicle and do this task. Another member called Stody said he joined the class in March 1976 during a time where he was searching for meaning in life. I don't know what I did to deserve to be here, Stody says with a slight hint of a southern accent. I'm the happiest person in the world. The Heaven's Gate members expressed their appreciation to Do and T for their patience as the class worked through their human inclinations. They also anticipate how the media is going to depict Do and T, and say that they are taking their lives on their own terms. I'm going to shed this husk, it's worthless, it's useless to me, says Tlody, who wears a navy button-down shirt and explains that his impending poisoning and asphyxiation is no different than a chrysalis shedding its cocoon. He continues. The bottom line is I am doing this of my own free will, I have chosen to do it, it's not something that somebody brainwashed me into or convinced me of or did a con job on, 
it's something I have grown to know and understand and of my own will have chosen to do. This planet has become a hideous, hideous place, they take control of you from the cradle to the grave, you have no choices unless the next level offers you choices, and most of the time you're herded around like animals. For their last supper, Heaven's Gate traveled up to Carlsbad to dine at Marie Callender's. They all shared the same meal at the chain restaurant, iced teas with lots of lemon, salad with a tomato vinegar dressing, turkey pot pie for their main course, and cheesecake with blueberries on top for dessert. The purchases were noted in their ledger, and their server recalled the bunch as upbeat, polite, and decidedly not depressed. Had the final exit happened a few weeks earlier, cult member Rio D'Angelo might have been among the dead. Just weeks before the suicides, D'Angelo approached Du with a premonition that he had a different role to play in the cult. I had this feeling that was the same feeling that I had when I joined, it was kind of an irresistible feeling that my focus, or my task, was different, said D'Angelo, who first encountered the group in 1988. I felt like I had a task to do outside of the class for the class in some way that I did not understand. As reported in Heaven's Gate, Inside Story, after an emotional conversation, Applewhite told D'Angelo that his leaving was probably part of the design, and he left the cult, going to work for Interact Entertainment Company in Beverly Hills. On March 26, 1997, D'Angelo received the exit tapes via Federal Express, as well as a note that outlined the suicides and what door to enter the mansion. The following day D'Angelo hitched a ride from his boss, Nick Matsorkis, and together they made the nearly three-hour drive south to Rancho Santa Fe. At 18241 Kalina Norte, D'Angelo entered the same side door that investigators would find unlocked hours later, smelled the same sense of decomposition, and called out to see if anyone was still alive. No one answered. And so I walked around the house videotaping things, because I wanted to make sure that this was portrayed accurately, D'Angelo recalled in a documentary. It was a lot of anxiety, trying to keep the camera from shaking, dealing with emotions. Here were people that I loved that were now gone. After he finished documenting the scene, D'Angelo placed that then anonymous 911 call to San Diego law enforcement. Rancho Santa Fe would never be the same. After the 39 left. The following week, a 58-year-old recluse named Robert Leon Nichols killed himself in his rural home in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains. A Los Angeles Times article reported that Nichols, a former Grateful Dead roadie who wrote a book about traveling to Egypt with the band, tied a plastic bag around his head and turned on the propane gas hose in his trailer. He left behind a note that said he was joining the spaceship behind the Hale-Bopp comet. He had covered his body with a purple scarf. Investigators also found a homemade tinfoil spaceship and solar system hanging above Nichols' bed. The following month, residents of Kalina Norte decided to rename their street Paseo Victoria after a child who lived on the private street, not to honor the girl but to take the heat off of their now notorious neighborhood. We've had weird people stop and get out of their cars and start praying, Rancho Santa Fe resident Diane Dorisky told the Associated Press. Neighbors who lived in the Beverly Hills of San Diego would later buy the severely devalued mansion for $688,000, the land itself was valued at $1.5 million, and bulldoze the final resting place of the 39 Heaven's Gate members. In May 1997, Two months after the 39 dead members of Heaven's Gate were discovered, CNN and 60 Minutes received eerily similar goodbye tapes that pointed them to a holiday in Express in Encinitas, about four miles from the Rancho Santa Fe mansion. Inside room 222 they found the body of Wayne Cook, 45. Charles Humphreys, a computer expert who was the same age, was clinging to life. Both wore black Nikes and were you guessed it, covered in purple shrouds. Cook, a former playwright and sculptor who had been fascinated with the stars since growing up on a farm in Oklahoma, had lost his wife in the mass suicide. 
Humphreys was in critical condition, but later released from the hospital, the following year, he would successfully kill himself in the Arizona desert. Because many of the cult members did not leave behind wills, executing their estates fell on San Diego County. Leading up to a public auction to pay for funeral expenses, two former Heaven's Gate members, Mark and Sarah King, filed a lawsuit and were eventually awarded Applewhite's religious writing and the group's intellectual property, which included the so-called exit tapes, alien drawings, and t-shirts reading, Far From Home. In 1999, an auction held at a county government warehouse netted $32,707 in proceeds for the victims' families. Resellers scooped up the infamous bunk beds for a few hundred bucks and the cult's book collection, which included the Star Trek Encyclopedia, Disneyland of the Gods, and Aliens from Outer Space, for $340. The minivan and moving vans that whisked Heaven's Gate around were sold off, as well as everyday items that included office chairs, dishes, VCRs, and a small trampoline. The Los Angeles Museum of Death acquired some items as well, including bunk beds, the black clothes, and purple shrouds that are on display at the Hollywood location, along with a cult recruiting video. And HeavensGate.com, with the red alerts that tipped off authorities to this wild UFO religion, is still active. In March 2017, a Daily Mail reporter interviewed the two nameless webmasters who keep the site up and running and claim to be connected to the next level and still share the group's beliefs. They field about 10 to 12 emails a day, sell a handful of books, and mail about 40 VHS tapes on Heaven's Gate teachings a year. Many speculate that the webmasters are the Phoenix couple who sued for Heaven's Gate's intellectual property in the late 90s. Nike discontinued the Air Model sneakers after the suicides, but collectors can still bid on them on eBay, white Nike Airs could set you back a few hundred dollars, and the iconic black pairs are listed for thousands of dollars. And, with a quick Google search and eight dollars, you too can own a pin replica of the Heaven's Gateway Team patch. Sylvia Mraz Marino's Santa Muerte Cult She wears a long flowing pink or white wedding gown, a nun's habit, or blue and yellow starred cape, similar to the Virgin of Guadalupe. Though her followers might call her the woman in white, this is no mother of God, but Santa Muerte, Saint Death. This Mexican folk saint is beloved by those living in both the light and shadows of society, with devotees ranging from drug traffickers looking for protection to job seekers asking for her help in finding work. She is depicted as having the face of a skeleton, her thin body covered up except for her bony fingers that grip a scythe, the grim repress. Santa Muerte worship, which has its roots in Mexico's colonial era, was virtually unheard of a generation ago. The cult came out of the closet according to religious scholar and Santa Muerte expert Andrew Chestnut, when Enriqueta Romero, known as Dona Cueta, put a life-sized statue of Saint Death outside her home in the Mexico City barrio of Tepito on Halloween 2001. The religious offshoot has grown to an estimated 12 million followers since then, according to the National Post, with devotees in the United States, United Kingdom, and other countries beyond Mexico. Santa Muerte is considered the fastest-growing new religious movement of our time. Unlike a canonized saint, which goes through a formal recognition process by the Catholic Church, Santa Muerte is among the dead spirits that are considered holy for their miracle-working powers. She's more approachable, less uptight than a traditional saint, someone you might feel more comfortable turning to for luck in nefarious business dealings than God, the Virgin Mary, or Saint Francis of Assisi. She has a number of nicknames, and her followers fondly refer to her as the Pretty Girl, La Flaquita, Skinny Girl, and the Bony Lady. Earlier in the 20th century, 
women might have prayed to Santa Muerte to make her cheating husband faithful again. In recent years, with the ongoing drug war in northern Mexico that has killed thousands of people, Santa Muerte has gained popularity among gangs and prisoners, who look to her for protection. Prayer cards showing Saint Death have also been found on murdered bodies and on the dashboards of cars transporting drugs. Saint Death has also become a favorite among the poor and other marginalized groups in society, such as transgender women, who might be excluded from attending church or receiving communion and other sacraments. She's been called the ultimate multitasker, and her followers use different colored candles for different kinds of prayers, red for love, gold for money, black for vengeance. Santa Muerte isn't officially recognized by the Catholic Church. In National Geographic News, a Vatican leader denounced the veneration of Saint Death in 2013 as blasphemy, dressed up like religion, and a Vatican-trained exorcist Rizak reported that praying to the skinny girl might lead to demonic issues. In an attempt to discourage Santa Muerte worship, the Church suggested Saint Jude, the patron saint of hope and lost causes, as an alternative, bumping up his feast day from once a year to once a month. The Mexican government has also played a role in discouraging followers of the skinny lady, shutting down a Mexico City Santa Muerte church in 2005 and destroying nearly 40 roadside shrines near the border of California and Texas in 2009. But these warnings haven't stopped Saint Death devotees, who pray to her at these shrines or at their personal home altars, bringing her alcohol, cigarettes, incense, food, and other offerings in exchange for help, wealth, protection, and whatever else they ask for. It was at one of these home shrines that Silvia Moraz Moreno, 44 at the time of her arrest in 2012, offered more to holy death, fresh human blood harvested just for the occasion, with hopes that her holy queen would bring the Moreno's desperately needed money. Moreno lived with her extended family on the outskirts of Nacozari de Garcia in Mexico, a small mining town of about 11,500 people less than 100 miles south of the United States border. Even though Nacozari had largely been spared from the drug cartel violence sweeping northern Mexico, Moreno's family had plenty of other things to worry about. They lived in crude shacks that, by some accounts, had bare dirt floors. The men of the family earned meager incomes by picking through garbage, and a revolving door of unfamiliar men led authorities to believe that the women were working as prostitutes, though authorities could never find enough evidence to make any charges stick. A local church took pity on this down-and-out bunch, giving them used clothes, food, and livestock to help them scrape by. On three separate occasions from 2009 to 2012, Moreno convinced members of her family to kill three people and offer their blood to the bony lady. Illuminated by candlelight, their victims' veins were sliced open while their hearts were still beating. They bled out in this horrifying manner, their blood, pooled and collected in a container, was later given as an offering to Santa Muerte at the family shrine. Investigators reported finding blood evidence spread across more than 30 square meters on the property, and determined that axes and knives were used to carry out the bloody sacrifices. To make a horrifying scene even more grim, two of the victims were ten-year-old boys and allegedly related to the Morenos. The killing started in 2009 with Moreno's close friend, Cleotilde Romero, 55. In July 2010, the first of the young boys, Martin Rios Chaparro, went missing, and foul play was not suspected because the authorities were told that he had been spotted begging in a nearby town. It wasn't until another ten-year-old boy, Jesus Martinez, went missing in March 2012 that the connection was made between the missing boys and the Moreno family. Silvia Moraz Moreno, then 44, and seven additional family members were arrested the following month. Everyone pointed to Silvia as the ringleader. Much remains a mystery about Silvia Moraz Moreno and her family cult, described as a satanic sect by the Sonora State Investigative Police, and this murderous group is certainly the most elusive of this book. What little is known comes from a press conference following the arrest, 
where Moreno and her family members were lined up, their arms linked, flanked by masked police officers wielding assault-style long guns. She was going to offer us money, Moreno told the reporters, referring to Santa Muerte. During the appearance, Moreno clutched a large framed image of Saint Death wearing a red cape and told reporters that she had been devoted to the deity for about two years. Moreno didn't say anything about killing the two boys but confessed that her family killed her friend, Cleotilde Romero, because she was a witch or something. Most media accounts say the bodies were buried outside of town, but some accounts suggest at least one of the bodies was buried under a child's bedroom floor. The Mexican newspaper El Mundo reported that three children aged one, two, and five witnessed the final human sacrifice and beheading of 10-year-old Jesus Martinez. Mexican authorities said the Nakozari killings were the first human sacrifice to Saint Death in Sonora that they knew of, but that the killings conjured up the infamous narco satanico killings of the 1980s when 15 bodies, including a missing American college student from Texas on spring break, were found at a ranch outside of Matamoros, Texas. In addition to 75 pounds of marijuana, rotting corpses, missing hearts, eyes, testicles, and other organs were found. Some of the victims were boiled in an oil drum found at the scene, which was covered with human hair, liquor, machetes, and tape. Cult members later testified that the gang believed that the ritual killings would protect them from the police and make them invincible from bullets. Moreno and her family dropped out of the news after their horrifying arrest, and Moreno is reportedly spending the rest of her life in prison for her ritual acts.